Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are sitting in the back row, or if it's your first time here, and you enjoy what you are hearing, please consider hitting that subscribe button, and don't forget to hit that notification bell and set it to all. That way you get reminded of every time I upload a video. Also, if you enjoy what you're hearing, you can buy me a coffee, or if you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel, all of that can be found down in the description box. With all of that out of the way, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crazy X Stories. Right after this intro, an ad will be played. I'll read the first story, an ad will be played. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Caution, some of these stories may be triggering for some. Listener discretion is highly advised. I had this boyfriend who would get mean during sex and choke me harder sometimes out of nowhere and give me this weird look and he'd explained it to me as having multiple personalities and one of them was a woman in his bed who he's dating who is jealous of me and wants to kill me and she comes out during sex and he was always arguing with her he also had a personality who would beg to finger me on my period this gets graphic here so I'm just gonna say he enjoyed getting his red wings if you know, you know. I honestly tried to be there for him, but I was like 16, and now that I'm an adult looking back, this does not sound right. I remember after small arguments, he'd sit in the corner, holding his legs, shaking back and forth, catonic for literally hours. But he wasn't really catonic because if someone else were to step in the room, he'd suddenly snap out of it. He was as normal and charming as could be in public. And around friends, this stuff only happened if we were home alone. He even would write me letters in different handwriting, and they'd either be nice or mean, wanting to get rid of me. I don't understand how I was just okay with it. He's married now and happy, and I've never heard of anyone else seeing him do this shit. Me and my ex broke up about a year ago, and it got very messy. I was reviving DMs, texts, and Snapchats from what seemed like everyone from her hometown. I got everything from calling me names to death threats. I ended up having to block out 10 people from three different sources of social media, but that's besides the point. The worst threats I received was from her recent ex. One read, Oh, you hurt my girl? <laughs> it's over for you. I know what town you live in. I will find you. And when I do, even your parents won't be able to recognize your body. He also sent me several other explaining the ways he would torture me. I just ended up blocking him along with everyone else and moved on with my life. Well, today, getting close to our one year of breaking up, me and my ex have started to talk again on okay terms, and everything seemed fine. I go about my day and walk over to his popular deli to grab a bite to eat, so I end up passing a friend of mine along the way. They shout my name across the street and head over. We talked for a bit and split ways as I headed over towards the deli. This is when I was approached by three taller guys. My fucking stomach hit the ground when I saw the guy's face. It was the ex-boyfriend I knew instantly from having to stare at his profile picture. And he brought friends. He found me. He quickly grabbed my shoulder tightly and looked me in the eyes. I stared back into his, and they seemed 
full of rage and insanity. <laughs> I finally found you, he said, in probably the most calm voice he continued to whisper. You know what I have to do to you now. I am a man of my word. Every inch in my goddamn body began to crawl. Fight or flight was kicking in, and time felt like it was going so slow. My brain is running a million miles per hour. Three versus one, okay? This isn't good, but they can't just kill me here in broad daylight. Do they have a car? Oh God, are they going to kidnap me first? I started to look for an exit. He then tightened his grip and said, Nobody is going to save you. You're not worth it. That's when I booked it full pedal to the metal. I knocked his grip off of me and watched as three guys tried to grab me, but I was already gone. I ran as fast as I could. Thankfully, I know the area pretty well, so I took off towards the direction of my friend's apartment. They chased after me, screaming full-blown battle cries. I turned the other corner, and by the luck of a million gods, somebody was exiting my friend's apartment building, which had a lock on it from the outside gate. I dashed in and slammed the gate behind me. I watched for about five minutes as they searched for me nearby the area I was in, checking in and behind dumpsters. These guys were serious. I feel lucky to even be telling this event right now. This is one crazy motherfucker I hope I never meet again. This happened about nine years ago. I was living with a roommate at the time in a townhouse in a suburb of Denver. My boyfriend at the time had always been kind of abusive with the occasional slap or pinning me down to the floor. But after a family member that he was close to committed suicide, he really lost it. My ex, Pierce, just lost it in the middle of an argument one day about a week after the funeral and threw me to the ground, punching my arm over and over until there was a giant bruise on one shoulder and a handprint slap bruise on the other. My face also ended up becoming swollen and I had a bloody lip. My roommate called the police and he ended up being arrested and no contact order was put in place. He was also ordered to go to counseling and maybe drug and alcohol meetings, even though at the time he didn't use. Fast forward a few months. I'm living with this roommate because I was completely financially dependent on him. She's taken it upon herself to pay for me to get my GED. That woman is a saint. I just needed to throw that out there by the way and a lot of time was spent on studying for the subjects after everything i was very agoraphobic but i even mentioned to forge some online friendships and maybe even something more with a genuinely nice guy one day pierce's grandmother stopped by to take me to pay my phone bill she lived close by in the same townhome complex and was more or less right behind where I lived. I remember it being the first beautiful day and slightly warm after a long winter. So I opened all the blinds to let the sunlight in and left them open when I left. After paying my phone bill, Pierce starts calling her. I wasn't too concerned because I knew that he was supposed to be at his court mandated counseling shortly. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but his grandmother told him that we will just stop at McDonald's. Again, not an issue at this point. I continued to eat my Big Mac or whatever until maybe three minutes later. Pierce calls again. His grandmother tells him that she's 
probably going to be home in about 10 minutes. The call ends. I finish my food and we leave, again in the car, as I'm maybe two minutes away from where I live. Pierce calls again. I still can't hear his side of the conversation, but his grandmother tells him the intersection we just passed had suddenly became bumper to bumper. I have this terrible sinking feeling in my stomach. I know something is wrong and I can't identify what, but I know in my heart of heart that something is very wrong. I considered asking his grandmother for help, but for context, his grandmother, on multiple occasions, watched Pierce hit me or try to strangle me and openly expressed disgust at how I can't help but piss them off. This same lady that knew her daughter, Pierce's mother, broke Pierce's nose when he was six because she saw his mother flip someone off and copied her and did nothing to intervene or let her know that wasn't okay. The family member Pierce was mourning for often told him he was a fuck up and was probably the most verbally and emotionally abusive I've ever witnessed in real life or any movie, book, or whatever. So this family is just super fucked and abusive. To other people, to each other, and so I'm completely alone in this situation. Anyway, his grandma pulls in front of my house where I live, and I noticed that all the blinds that I had opened were now closed. We go inside, and once she leaves, I walk upstairs to my room and see a random Word document open on my computer. Pierce had written a whole page worth of shit, but I only pay attention to the big words on the top. I read your emails. Immediately. I know that he'd seen the emails between me and the guy I'd met, even though they weren't outright sexual or flirty. You could kind of tell there was something there. My brain stopped reading at this point, and I need to figure out if he's still in this building. Because there's no contact order. I know he would have come in through the back door, so nobody could see him. So my mind latches onto this idea that if the back door is locked, he's probably gone. I run downstairs to the door and see that it's locked. But as soon as I reach the door, I hear a closet sliding open from the room I was just in. Loud and angry footsteps, and he's yelling my name. I know that this may sound weird, but I can't recall exactly all the details. I remember his face in mine before I could understand what was happening. I remember being back up in that room again. I think to go through all of my emails with him, and I remember him slapping me hard in the face over and over until I was dizzy. I remember somehow convincing him to let me use my phone to respond to one of my roommate's texts. I don't remember what I said, but I remember that she called right away. I remember Pierce standing two feet away from me and looking at me, believing he is going to kill me and my roommate asking me, are you safe? I only said, no. She told me that she was on her way and would be there as fast as she could. Eventually, Pierce became convinced that I had called the police and with a knife in his hands told me if they were coming anyway, that he might as well give me what I deserve. I managed to convince him that I did not called the police and then he started crying about how terrible of a person he was and threatened to kill himself with that knife so with a handprint on my swollen face i try to convince him that he wasn't terrible and to please not kill himself until my roommate came home insane ex-boyfriend i moved three states had my name changed and only feel safe in buildings in big cities where I'm at least three stories up. I hope I never meet your fucking crazy ass again.
This just happened tonight. So this shit is fresh. And I'm freaked out and honestly pissed off. I'm a 23-year-old female. I had met Jason, who was 29, from an app online last September. We clicked immediately. And from then on, went out together about once a week sometimes twice. We've spent the past year going on dates, out to nice restaurants, garden walks, spending the night, etc. We established that we had feelings for each other about two months into everything, though we had our rocky moments and I didn't fully trust him. At one point, I wanted to date, but he claimed he was too busy with work, which subsequently caused us to separate for a while. Once we eventually came back together, I told him I didn't want to be exclusive, but we could still hang out as I enjoyed his company. Now, there was always some sneaking suspicions that there was another partner in his life because he always paid in cash wherever we went and was very secretive about his private life. I had voiced these thoughts to him, but honestly, I didn't care too much after he told me he wasn't interested in dating me. I also started seeing another partner and was using protection with both of them. Meanwhile, he didn't want to date me but raged whenever he thought there was another man in my life. He has exhibited some concerning and possessive behaviors but I let him slide for the most part because I was still doing whatever I wanted to do. Fast forward to tonight, November 19, 2019, 14 months after we met. We went to a really nice restaurant downtown after work, and I asked if he wanted to take the subway back to my place since we had a few drinks. We stopped by his car to grab his bag, and off we went to the station. When we got to the station, he said he forgot his card in the car. And I figured, mm, no biggie, and swiped for him. I said he didn't need to pay me back because it was only like two bucks. But he insisted that he would Venmo me. When we got to the apartment, I told him he was welcome to take a shower. And he went to the bathroom. I was messing around on my phone and saw CS had sent me $2 for the train. This was weird to me because his initials are JN. So I clicked on the Venmo friends list. He only had around 20 Venmo friends, so I picked a random person and looked them up on Facebook. I went down their friends list, and would you look at that, a picture of Jason and his brother. Only issue is, the name was Chase Smith. The photo did look a little different because he was about 50 to 60 pounds heavier in the photograph and is currently very fit but I was 90% sure it was him just to confirm I googled his name and the area around which he lives and I got a hit on white pages it said he was related to Velma and Shaggy Smith I remember him telling me that his siblings were named Velma and Shaggy so it turned out I don't even know the name of the guy I've been boinking for a year. He got out of the shower and sat down on the bed. I was quiet and looked at his face asking, Is your real name Chase Smith? This motherfucker looked me dead in my eye and said, No. You guys, I lost it. Like, I made the leave Britney alone guy look cool and calm and collected started crying and telling him to get the fuck out of my house he approached me and I told him not to touch me but he grabbed my wrists and insisted that we talk about it I told him again to get the fuck out of my house and never contact me again he refused to leave for a while but eventually did afterwards I looked a little deeper and found out he has criminal records, though I can't see what they are for. From his past behavior, I'm honestly a little worried for my safety because I immediately blocked him on everything, and I know for a fact 
He's going to go eight shit when he realizes he cannot contact me. Everything has been a lie. When you think you know someone, it turns out they're probably crazy. Admittedly, it's a little bit funny because what the fuck, but also turns out they're probably just as crazy. Admittedly, it's a little bit funny because what the fuck, but also I'm getting some you vibes. <laughs> I'm not ready to die yet, you know? So it'd be cool if Chase Smith never came around again. Oh yeah, here's an update. So my sister has continued to sleuth. Turns out today he slightly changed the spelling of his last name on Facebook, probably to deter others he's been messing with from finding his profile. He doesn't know how I found him and doesn't realize that the spelling of his last name wasn't relevant to the process. The dude is an actual psycho who is probably doing this to multiple women. I'm honestly more afraid for them than myself because they clearly don't know what's going on. If he's taking further steps to hide himself, I don't know. I wished I knew who they were so I could reach out and warn them ahead of time. It's hard to pinpoint when this occurred because every time I think that it's finally over, I'm reminded that it's not. Tate was my very first ever boyfriend. This story is supposed to focus on the things he did after we broke up, so I'll quickly gloss over what happened during our relationship. And yeah, I was really stupid back then, so brace yourself for cringe. Also, prepare yourself for a lot of cussing. This is going to be a long and angry one. We started dating shortly before my 15th birthday. The whole relationship was a mess. He convinced me to steal money from my grandmother and run away with him. He cheated on me multiple times, got me pregnant, birth control failed, and dumped me for another girl, only to come crawling back after he had coerced me into having an abortion. He also lied a lot, and I do mean a lot. But of course, I forgave him over and over again. Yes, I know, I was stupid. The whole ordeal lasted 21 months before I'd finally had it and ended it once and for all. He frequently called me, sometimes in the middle of the night, often drunk or high. In a particularly hilarious instance, he called me while getting pounded by another guy to let me know that he was getting pounded by another guy. He would also pass my house, sending me messages like, I see your mom still drives the same car. One day he refused to leave until I came down and told him that I was done with him. I threatened to call the police which made him pissed off. I eventually just blocked him everywhere I possibly could. I started dating again, and three months after our breakup, her name was Emma. Tate somehow found out who I was dating and sent her faked screenshots of text messages that implied that I still loved him and wanted him back. In an attempt to sabotage my new relationship, Lucky for me, Emma has a brain and quickly caught on to the fact that he was just bullshitting her. Since I had him blocked on everything, he ended up messaging a friend of mine. One year into my relationship with Emma, he said that he'd been stalking me and was threatening to kill her. I called the cops, but they just told me that they couldn't do much as long as he was doing nothing but messaging me on the internet, which they see as harmless. Emma is still alive and well, so it was all empty threats, but it was certainly enough for me to be terrified to leave the house for a few months. Emma and I eventually broke up, 
once again. Tate somehow found out about that and decided to use this opportunity of me being single. Mind you, Emma and I dated for over two years, so Tate and I's breakup had been more than two and a half years ago. I also later found out that he had a girlfriend and a son. He turned up on my doorstep at five o'clock in the morning, mind you. He messaged me from a new profile and demanded I come downstairs to say goodbye because he was moving to LA. I'm going to Europe, so not only would he have needed a visa, which requires a lot of money and can take several years to be approved, his English skills were also particularly non-existent. He stood in front of my door, looking up at my window, smiling and waving. I told him to piss off or I'd call the cops. After which he went on a long rant about what a whore I was and how no one trusts him and, you know, just a lot of bullshit nonsense. I blocked the new profile, and when I dared to take another look out the window 30 minutes later, he was gone. I really don't know what would have happened if I had gone outside that day. That was three years ago, and I honestly thought that would be it. After all, our breakup happened almost six years ago now. A few minutes later, though, all righty, backstory needed. I fell in love with someone online. He lived in America. We got married, and I moved back to America. I decided to clean up my block list on Facebook. It had been such a long time. I didn't think much of it when I unblocked him. After all, I was married and lived halfway across the planet now. Not one month after I blocked him, he messaged me in the dead of the night, which would have been sometime in the morning for him. Hey, I was just going to stop by when I remembered you live 5,000 miles away now. How's it going? I have straight up no idea how he knows that I moved to America. The profile on Facebook is set to private. I had a mild anxiety attack even though I knew he literally couldn't get to me or touch me. I don't want to talk to you, was my response. Are you sure? I'd like to know how it's going with your husband and how is America. Yes, I'm sure. I don't want to tell you about me or my husband or my life in America. I'm done with you. I have been done with you. Leave me the fuck alone. His response was a one minute long voice message. I didn't listen to it because I didn't want to hear his voice. Instead, I forwarded it to a friend who listened to it for me. According to her, there was a lot of rambling. He apologized for the voice message, saying his cab driver had just punched him. Which leads me to believe that he was either drunk or high as hell. And how he still liked me. And if I wanted someone to talk to, he'd be there. The rest was unintelligible as there were sirens or something in the background. I never replied. Instead, I blocked him again. Every time something like this happens, I think it's the last time. But at this point, it feels like that I will never get rid of him. This event requires a bit of a backstory. In early 2014, my best friend Liv met a guy named Nathan at a club through one of her friends from her college. She and Nathan instantly hit it off and were officially dating within a few weeks. It only took a few months for Lily to fall head over heels for this guy. Before long, she was even telling me that she thought he was the one. I was happy for her experiencing some good old college romance. It even eventually led her to losing her virginity to this guy. I really had no opinions on this guy from what I heard from Lily. 
From what I heard at first, he sounded like a nice guy who just had a lot of bad stuff happen to him. This guy had some serious baggage. He had a poor background and lived with his grandmother. I can't remember if he ever told Lily about his parents or not. He had a three-year-old son named Isaac, whose mother was a drug addict. Lily was in love with Nathan so much that she was willing to just stick with him and help him with some of the drama. In spite of hearing so much about him, I only met him twice. Once then, he was picking Lily up from work. We work at the same place. And second, when... Eh, well, uh, I'll get to that. However, things first went downhill when Nathan broke up with Lily in September. He had recently become a rookie police officer and was moving to a different city for more training. He said he would come back for her. Still, Lily was devastated by this, but unexpectedly, he was back in town within a month. This whole episode just felt off to me. Lily and Nathan tried to start things up again, and things were starting to look up for the couple. That is until Christmas rolled around. And somewhat straight out of a soap opera, Lily broke up with Nathan on Christmas after finding out some damning information about him. After the breakup with Lily in September, he apparently went and slept with one of his cousins and got her pregnant. His cousin later had a miscarriage, and to add to that, Nathan revealed that he had both chlamydia and genital herpes. He knew she had these, and yet he purposefully didn't tell Lily in order to have lots of unprotected sex with her. Lily got herself tested immediately. When she didn't contract chlamydia, she tested positive for genital herpes. As expected, she was devastated by this and went through a brief period of depression. It quickly becomes apparent that Nathan was not all the type of the person Lily had first met. He was a sexist, a womanizer, a cheater, a liar. He had sex with multiple women and, just like with Lily, he kept the information about his STDs secret. He even tried to turn all of his friends against Lily, saying that she broke up with him and even tried to drive them apart. Lily and Yasmina, the fiancé of one of Nathan's cousins who was now close with Lily. Lily didn't stand for this and made sure the truth was known. She talked to Yasmina and her fiancé about it, and then they eventually kicked Nathan out of her place. Word began spreading in Nathan's community about his wrongdoings, and even his backup girlfriend broke up with him. It wasn't too long before Lily was taking self-defense and gun classes. Nathan knew where she lived and obviously had some weapons training due to being a rookie police officer, a job he soon lost. She often told me how she was somewhat afraid of him, but mostly she was just furious. If he had even tried to hurt her, I'm sure she would have blown his brains out. Anyway, my second and final encounter with Nathan was at the trail end of this drama earlier this year. My first encounter with Nathan had been brief, but afterwards, Lily had told me that Nathan had been initially jealous of me due to the fact that I was a close guy friend of Lily's. We've been friends since we were toddlers. And that we had dated back during freshman year of high school. While our first encounter had been brief and under friendly terms, our second encounter was far from that. I had the morning shift at work that day and had just ended my shift. It was early in the afternoon, so I was hurrying to my car to get out of the heat. As I walked to my car, I quickly noticed Nathan leaning against his car a few rows away. As you would expect, I was furious upon seeing him, given all the crap he'd caused for my friend. I assumed that he was waiting for her, Lily, or 
something. I only chuckled because Lily was on a family vacation in Montana at the time. I decided not to confront him. I was also keen on listening to Lily and give my two cents, but for the most part, I had been successful at staying away from this drama. Suddenly, Nathan turned in my direction and immediately stood up completely. He tapped on his car and, who I assumed was a friend of his, stepped out. They began to power walk in my direction. Wasting no time, I jumped in my car and started the ignition and pulled out of my parking spot. As I did, I heard a loud knock on the back of my car. I looked in the rear view mirror to see Nathan punching the back window in some feeble attempt to stop me. I kept going. I was almost out of the parking lot when I looked in my rear view mirror again to see his car speeding in my direction. I sped out of the parking lot with him right on my tail. He continued to follow me for several streets. There was no way I was heading home with him following me. I ended up taking the craziest detour of my life, pulling on and off feeders, driving through parking lots, driving circles in neighborhoods. Name it, and I did it all. Eventually, after about 25 minutes of driving, I lost him. I drove around for a little while afterwards, in case, just to make sure I had officially lost him. When I got home, I called Lily and told her everything. She thought about calling the police, but before we could decide on whether or not to do that, Lily got a call from Yasmina, who had been spying on Nathan for Lily for quite some time. We learned that Nathan had apparently packed up his stuff from where he was living and taken off. He was gone. To where? I don't know. I heard rumors about him wanting to go to New York City and Mexico, but those are the only possibilities I remember. All that matters now is that he's officially out of Lily's life. I'm not sure what would have happened if he had caught me that day. Lily guessed that Nathan might have been trying to hurt me in order to get back at her. I'm glad that I was good enough of a driver to lose him. Otherwise, I don't want to think about what he could have done to me. Nathan, I hope Lily and I never meet you again. My father had been dating this girl for a while, and things were going great. She met us a few times and got along great with my sister and I. Eventually, my father asked her to move in with us. She drove seven hours to move in and brought her two cats. Things were great for the first two months until she couldn't find a job. They had agreed that she was to apply for jobs and have one secured for an interview before she even moved in. Well, she moved in on July 2nd. She didn't have a job until late January. I, being fresh out of high school with no experience in a job setting, was able to get a job before her. This caused my father to have to cover her car payment and insurance. This set us back financially, but we were okay. Then October came when the discovery of a full year's worth of text messages between her and a friend of hers named Jared, all taking place when after my father and her were dating and all the while she was living in her hometown. These text messages were, these text messages were laced with him coming over and giving her nightmare lovings and inappropriate pictures. My father confronted her about it, and she denied it, saying we just didn't understand her friendships. My father lets it go, as they haven't messaged each other in weeks. Small arguments pop up, and she starts sneaking money out of my dad's wallet at night to go buy cigarettes. 
This may only sound like a small amount, but it was a nightly occurrence. This set us back financially as well. These arguments mainly consisted of her lying about something and not admitting to it or her doing something stupid and not apologizing. Things got worse as Christmas came. My father expressed that he didn't love her anymore. He didn't have any feelings towards her and that she needed to work to fix the relationship if she wanted to continue. This meant really trying to get a job and not lying about stupid shit. She agreed that she would. I advised him against giving her the option. I was tired of her shit and I wanted her out. She started lying more and more and causing more problems. We believe she started taking some sort of drug as she would come back from a drive all shaky and spazzing out, spouting nonsense. She came after myself and a friend of mine during one of their arguments to which my father responded, pack your shit up and get the fuck out of my house. Are you crazy? How dare you go after my kid, you bitch? Telling her to get out and leave was a regular occurrence in their fights, but she never took the hint. She was abusive emotionally to everyone in the household, especially my father reducing him to tears when he found out that she had been receiving $1,000 a month from her mother, which would have had us staying up to date on rent payments. We have no idea what she did with the money. No matter the situation, she would try to twist it so we should be the victim. Even calling my father, asking second opinions, the party of persecuting Martha. Nothing is ever her fault. It's always a misunderstanding. Then she started smoking in the garage. The door from the garage into the house is right across from my bedroom door, which is always open because our cats like sleeping on my bed with me. I have asthma. I woke up coughing and smelling cigarettes multiple times in one night because of her. She drove recklessly with my sister and I in the car before I told my father what had happened. When my father confronted her on it, she said that I was over-exaggerating, that driving in the dark freaks her out, that my sister and I, in our, it's too early for this, I'm going to sleep and listen to my earbuds state, were stressing her out. A minor thing, but... She endangered my sisters and my own cat. We have two strictly indoor cats, and the two were outdoor cats, until they moved here. Her cats have taught mine how to sneak out of the house when the back door isn't latched. She leaves the front door open constantly when she comes back in from smoking and lets my cats get out. We live right across the street from a huge lot of desert and we hear the coyotes every night she just lets them get out at night before after she finally got a job she didn't want to contribute her fair share of the bills my father asked for half of her paychecks every two weeks she claimed that it should only be 25 percent because there are four people in the house my sister and I are only there on the weekend as we go to school out of town. It's about an hour away. And stay with another family during that time. She also apparently wasn't paying her car payment after she got her job, as she got a repossession notice, which she hid from my father. Finally, after financially wrecking us, abusing my father emotionally and financially, endangering myself and my sister, doing drugs, taking money, stealing things from my room, endangering my cats, and many other things. My father gave her two weeks to move out. She moved out yesterday, and all I have to say to her is let's not meet again, because I will not be nice like I had been before. Lots of hate. The daughter of the man you broke.
Since this happened several years ago, I might get some parts mixed up or some events I may have forgotten, so I'll try to retell my experience as best as I can. I also apologize for not being a good writer. It's probably going to be all jumbled up and confusing, but please bear with me. Here's a bit of a backstory. When I was a little kid, and my mom would visit my grandparents, and we would all go to church together when we would visit from out of town. I had a friend at that church who I would be super excited to visit every time I went. We would talk a lot about Pokemon and just stuff like that in general. Around the time I started puberty, he seemed to be attracted to me. He would hug me and ruffle my hair. He was a big guy, always wore the same yellow shirt. It seemed innocent for a while, and we sort of had a relationship for a few months. Everything was good, up until we were dating. I was probably around 16, and he was several years older than I. He one day confided in me that he could see angels, and he was given a sword from Jesus to fight demons. Yes, he really said that. He said that he could see angels and that Jesus Christ himself gave him a sword, which he stores in his body, to fight demons. And as stupid as I was, I believed him. I don't know why, but I did. The times where I wasn't visiting, we would talk over stream when we played TF2 most of the time. He then tells me the stories of fighting demons and would talk to me through his angel and it got so much weirder he would tell me how i would be his princess in heaven and that we would rule together that's around the time i started getting uncomfortable and weirded out whenever he would try to hug me or try to go further with me at one point over an incident i can go over later I tried to cut ties with him and break up. He would not have it one bit. He would continuously send me emails begging for me to come back and how I was making a bad choice leaving him. The last time I ever came in contact with him was also the last time I went to that church. Me and my mom and my little brother all had to go to the church for a small get together for my grandma's birthday party. Knowing the ex's family caters church events, I knew in my gut he was going to probably be there. My mom told me not to worry about it when I knew that something was going to happen. When we arrived, I told my mom that I was going into a room where the little kids were playing at, where I knew I would be safe while we waited for a cake. I luckily brought my DS to distract myself and sat down to play. All of a sudden, I felt like somebody was looming over me. A big presence. I knew it was him. I instantly went into flight mode and ran and hid around the church until he stopped following me and looking for me. My mom and my brother instantly took me back to the house after I came out of hiding and I never went back to that church. I hope we never, ever, ever meet again. Epilogue. When we visit my grandparents now, I stay back at the house while everyone else goes to church. My mother occasionally goes to church with them and sometimes encounters him. He tells my mom weird cryptic shit sometimes. Sometimes, I just want to just go back just to tell him to never talk to my family ever, ever again. Alrighty, dear listeners, that brings the close to these true crazy X stories. I know it's a pinch shorter than usual but i'll be coming out with some longer videos soon 
Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Christy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Glemko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for your continued support of Back to Ashes. For without you, there would not be a me or the channel. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll read to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.